Well, we're beginning a new series that we're calling, as you can see on the TV here, Around the Fire. And of course, we brought a fire. So it makes it, so we'll start moving it around. Everybody will sit around the fire. Soon, soon you'll be up here. You won't be caring about sitting in your chair, freezing in a blanket. Um, the reason we're doing this is we thought it'd be a great opportunity for us. You know, the Bible gives this incredible picture all over, all over the Bible. The, 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 this picture of fire is used and it's a beautiful, there's some beautiful pictures and we want to look at them. We're going to start from just the beginning of, of, of the scriptures and work all the way through and look at this idea of what, um, you know, we're going to, tonight, we're going to focus on the idea of the flaming sword. And so if you know where that is in the, if you don't know, and you're like, I've, I have no idea what you're talking about, Genesis 3. So if you have a Bible, Genesis 3, I know it might be a little bit trickier out here. So if you didn't bring one, that's why we got the big giant screen here. Verses are going to be up there. I also have a lot of notes that I have for you. Not that I assumed you'd take notes. So I've got them up here for you. And I'll put them on the app. Daryl, just let, we'll, we'll get them on the app later. So if you want them, you don't have to take notes now. We'll get them to you. Okay. Um, so if you're there in Genesis 3, I want you to just flip back one chapter. There's only two to go. So flip back one chapter and look at Genesis 2 verse 4. And I want you to notice what it says there when it describes God. What is Genesis 1 about? There's my question for you. What's what? Creation, right? What's Genesis 2 about? Creation of, of man, right? In Genesis 1, it says this, and God created, and, and then God created, and, you know, God created, God created, God created, right? Genesis 2, verse 4, when it starts to describe the creation of man, I want you to notice how it describes God. Did you see what it says there? What's his name there in Genesis 2, verse 4? Somebody read it out loud, real loud. The Lord God. For the first time, not the last, but for the first time, God is not described as simply God, but he's called the Lord God. It's two words for God, in essence, being brought together. Jehovah Elohim. Now you say that's Hebrew. Why do I care about that? You don't. Don't worry about that part. The reason I, it said it and it sounded cool. But here's the main thing. This is a personal name of God. In fact, I'm going to show you this in Genesis 3. How God uses this as a way of connecting to mankind, to his special creation people. You're not just a part of creation. You're a special part of God's creation. And we're going to look at um, Genesis 3 and we're going to get an opportunity to kind of dig into it. So let's start verse 1. Now, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now, did you notice that twice it refers to God, but the first time it says that he is the Lord God who put man in the garden. But then when the serpent, and who is the serpent in Genesis chapter 3? It's the devil. We know that this is the devil, the, the one who is against God. I mean, literally from day one. And so how does the devil speak about God? He doesn't call him the Lord God, does he? He calls him God. And we're going to talk about why that is important in a little bit. Verses two and three, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Once again, there's a subtle change here. God refers to himself as the Lord God. Satan comes and says, did God say? And now Eve says the same thing. So something is happening here. And it's this first phrase that we read, has God, did God really say this to you? And Adam and Eve are the only people on the planet at this point, right? Two people living in a garden made by God for them, for the purpose of their enjoyment, for the, for the, that the world would be full of people who would know God, the Lord God, and have a relationship with the Lord God. And the devil comes and he's going to come and he's going to challenge to Eve who God is. You see, to the animals, God is merely a creator, but to man, to woman, he's something else. God wanted a unique relationship with humanity that he didn't have with anyone else. And Eve buys into the subtleties of the devil's lie here. And so what I'm going to do is I want you to see, I've got five things I want you to see that the devil challenges about God. And we're talking third chapter of the Bible, by the way. 
We're not very far into the whole world thing. And the devil's already coming, challenging who God is. So number one, and I told you, I'll have all these notes later. But number one, he challenges the nature of God. Has God. Number two, he challenges the words of God. Did God really say? Number three, he challenges the intent of God. You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Number four, he challenges the accuracy of God. You will not surely die. And number five, he's going to challenge the supremacy of God. God knows in the day that you eat of the tree of the fruit of knowledge of good and evil, you'll be just like him. God doesn't want you to be supreme like he is. And we're going to break this down. I went through him real quick, but let's start at, first, at the first one. He challenges the nature of God. We've already talked about it in some length, how that the devil's attack began against who God is. God wants more than just to be the creator in your life. Now he can't be, he, I mean, he will always be creator. Hey, look it, there's a drone. Hello. <laughs> See, you can't get that when you're inside, people. That doesn't happen. <laughs> that was awesome though. Yeah. Now I want one, that was so fun, yeah. You were made to be in a relationship with God. And, and do you understand that the very first thing that the devil wants to come and take away from you is the sense that you belong to God in any way more than just you're another animal. You're another part of God's creation. You're just one of many. The devil wants you to believe you're just, you're, you're not unique. You're not special. You don't, you don't have any special access to God. You don't have any special, you know, God doesn't have a special love for you. The devil wants you to believe that you're just one of Seven billion, and, and you're not special to God. The opposite is the, is the real story. You are made in his image. It's the very first thing that we read about when the Bible speaks about us. God says, let's make man in our image. Let's make someone who we can connect to and who can connect to us. And the devil comes, and the first thing, now by the way, I mean, I guess it was different times when Eve has a serpent talk to her and she doesn't freak out or faint or, you know, what would you do if a snake started talking to you? Run, yeah, yeah, run, yeah. Right, I mean, but it was a different, different time and something was happening and this serpent says to her, who is God really? Does he, does he really love you? We're being watched. This is often the beginning of a numbing that the devil wants to do in your life. Did you know that? The devil wants to numb you to what God wants to be and do in your life. And it always starts with ruining who God is to you. You see, if God is some inanimate force, like Star Wars, then you don't owe anything to him. You don't have to be accountable to him and you won't, you know, uh, this microphone has nothing to offer me. You know, it's, it's, uh, we're not going to be friends. There's no relationship. And if we, if, if the devil had his way, he would want you to believe that God is, is a force. He doesn't have, he can't be in an intimate relationship with you. It's the first thing that the devil wants to challenge. But the second thing that we talked about was the words of God. The devil comes and he challenges the words of God. Did God really say? If God isn't personal, then does he speak? And I want you to see as we go through each one of these, it goes down further and further and further. It starts with challenging the nature of God. But if God isn't real, if God isn't real in your life, if God doesn't want a real relationship with you, then what do his words even matter? Who cares? God speaks and the devil wants to come and say, hey, does, did God really say that? Does God really speak today? Is this really the voice of God? The third thing as we go down it is says this, um, or what I wrote down was this, the devil wants to challenge the intent of God. If God isn't personal, if God's word can be challenged, then it's only natural to challenge the intentions of God. Did God really say which is a question that you're supposed to say, oh, wait, wait, did he really say that? I don't know. I don't, did he really, is that what he said? Or did he, am I misquoting him? Or, and, and the idea is this, maybe God speaks, but are you sure that you really got his heart? Because maybe you're wrong. 
And I think of, and we talked about this on a Wednesday. I don't remember. All Wednesdays, they all, you know how we all, older we get, they all blur together. What I went. But we talked about that man who came to Jesus who was ill. And he said, if you're willing, you could make me whole. Not if you're able. He like believed God could do something. But he didn't think God would do something for him. And the devil wants you to live your life believing that maybe God's not for you. Yeah, he's real. Yeah, he's big. Yeah, he's a creator. Sure, he died on a cross, but he's not really for you. And the devil came to Eve with that challenge. And I'm telling you, if you haven't already heard it, it's coming. This is the challenge that all of us have. The devil wants to challenge the intentions of God. And I want you to notice what Eve does when the devil says that. Did God really say? Did you notice what she said? Look at verses, um, look at verse three. No, verse two and three. The woman said to the serpent, we can eat from the tree, uh, the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. So Eve does two things. And again, I'm going to put these on the screen, but you don't have to write them. I'll put them, I'll give them to you later. The first thing that Eve does is that she minimizes, I think, yeah, she minimizes the blessings we may eat of the fruit. She minimizes the blessings. The second thing that she does is she maximizes the repercussions. Nor shall you touch it. By the way, God didn't say either of those things. You know when the devil said, did God say? When she reiterates what God said, she says it wrong. Do you know God never said, if you touch that tree, I will kill you. What did he say? Don't eat from that tree. You will die. But he never said, if you touch it, you will die. Well, what's happening here? When you begin to buy into the lie that God doesn't love you, that God doesn't have a purpose for you, that God doesn't have a plan for you. When you buy into that lie, you will also buy into the lie that he's against you. When you begin to minimize God's blessings in your life, you will maximize the consequences. You, have you heard this when we say like a natural disaster happens and they say it's an act of isn't that terrible? It's an act of God, right? Somebody wins the lottery, they don't say it was an act of God. They bought the right ticket, right? Something good happens, we don't say that was an act of... When do we say something is an act of God? When something so terrible happened that you can't even imagine or fathom it being possible. Where does that come from? Guys, that's a demonic concept. And right now, the devil wants you and I to minimize God's blessings in our lives. To focus on what's wrong, on what's evil, on what's bad. Focus on the problems in your life. Focus on what God is not doing at this exact moment. God wants you to see his blessings and understand his heart. The devil wants the opposite. The devil wants you to believe that God wants what's bad for you, not what's good for you. And I've seen this happen so many times because I've done this so many times. It's so much easier to maximize repercussions. If I do this, oh, and because I feel guilty, I feel bad about something, I'm convinced God is just as mad as I am. But the heart of God is so much deeper and bigger and wider. He loves us more than that. The devil comes and he wants us to believe Tonight, the devil wants you to believe that God's intentions for you are not good. And if you begin to, and so what's happening here is the devil's kind of putting out a, a carrot and Eve we're seeing is going after it now. She's saying, yeah, God said we could eat. But you know what, you know what God said? God didn't say you can eat from the, the trees of the garden. God didn't say that. Do you know what he said? You may eat freely of every tree of the garden. I don't know about you, but the word free means a whole bunch in my, in my dictionary. I love that word, right? Free, freely. What is God saying? God is saying, I have made everything in here for you to absolutely enjoy as much as you could possibly enjoy in your life. Go for it. I made this all for you. Enjoy every bit of it. But now Eve, instead of seeing that God is, is doing something, a blessing, she begins to minimize it. Well, God said we can eat from the trees. No, no, that's not what God said. God said it's all yours and enjoy it to the fullness that you possibly can. But then when she talks and thinks about the bad part, she starts adding to God's words. Don't even touch it. 
You know, when your little kids were like, you know, don't touch that, right? And now she sees God in this, in this framework. She sees God as somebody who's saying, don't touch it. Don't, don't, if you touch that thing, I'm going to get you. Let's keep going. Let me read Genesis chapter 3 verses 4 and 5. I think we had a, yeah, we'll wait on that. But you can hear it. The serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so this leads us to our fourth and fifth challenge that the devil brings. Fourth, he wants to challenge the accuracy of God. When you challenge God's intentions, it's natural to challenge his accuracy. We can't trust his intentions. How could we trust that he's accurate? So the devil puts doubt. He, he, when she says, yeah, God, God did say that if I touch this thing, he's going he's gonna to kill us. And the devil flat out just lies. You will not die. You will not die. God is not accurate in what he's saying to you right now. And this is where it's getting a little bit deeper. It's getting a little bit more serious. Do you see what I'm talking about? In the beginning, it was like, hey, the nature of God, the words of God. But now the devil is flat out saying to her, you, I know you heard God say you will die, but I'm telling you, you will not die. You're not going to die. And then fifth, he challenges the supremacy of God. And that's this. The devil accuses God of fearing that others would know what he knows. If you eat from that tree, you're going to know everything that God knows. And God doesn't want anybody to be like him. What an insane concept that really is. And yet, and yet, it's a demonic idea. God is keeping something good from you. Because he doesn't want you to have information that he has. He doesn't want you to have blessing that he has. He's holding back. As if God's like, you know, I'm going to bless you, but I'm going to hold it back just a, a tiny bit. God's not doing that. Look at verse 6 of Genesis 3. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eye, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave it to her husband with her, and he ate. You know, for the whole time, Adam's been called Adam, but for the first time, he's just called her husband. And there's a reason, and we'll talk about that. It's not, yeah, yeah, we'll talk about that. First John chapter 2 verse 16 says this, All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. He, he, the, John mentions these three things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's exactly, it's exactly what happens here in Genesis chapter 3 verse 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise. That's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. She bought hook, line, and sinker into this. If I eat from this, now listen, you're all thinking, what kind of tree, what kind of fruit would make anybody feel that way? Like I've never eaten a fruit or vegetable that I, I was like, oh man, this, if I eat that, I will be, I will be the wisest person on the planet, you know? And yet somehow he had convinced her, and this is a part of what the devil wants to do. He wants to convince you that you go down that path, your life will be better. Life's going to work out for you. Just look at it. If you look at this, look at how great it is. You want this. This thing is going to be good for you. So she eats it. Adam eats it. Listen to what James chapter 1 says, verses 14 and 15. James said this, Each one of us is tempted when we're drawn away by our own desire and we're enticed. And when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. It's exactly what happened here in Genesis 3. She was tempted and drawn away by her desires. Her desires conceived into her an action. I've got to eat this fruit. And when she ate that, she sinned and she died. Now, it took 900 years for death to catch up. And that's always, listen, from the beginning of the Bible, we learn this. Sin kills, maybe not on the same day. Maybe not on the same day. It might take 900 years. But listen, I can guarantee you it's not going to take you 900 years. That's my promise. It's going to take a lot less. But it will, it will, it will. I have a friend, a good friend. And, you know, when we, um, I, I mentioned before, Joy and I, we would go witnessing with our youth group down at the beach in Huntington Beach and Laguna Beach all the time. And I had a friend who was telling me once he was down there and he was a pretty well-known surfer. 
And he was down there talking to a group of guys on, a, um, on motorcycles. And he's preaching the gospel and he's sharing with them, guys, you need to be born again. You know, and they knew who he was. They had seen him before and, and they're listening. But one of, the, one of the guys was just, you, you're nuts. And he had a whole bunch of, you know, other words to use and all. And he was just like, this is, I, I don't need Jesus. And, 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 um, and my friend, he, he told him, listen, you don't know when death could come to you. And the guy, you know, the guy even said, listen, I've got a long life ahead of me. Pulled off on his bike. He died a mile away. He was in a car accident. He was hit by a car a mile away from where he was just hearing the gospel. And that might not be, that's a pretty radical story. It might take you, it might take 50 years. But the reality is the Bible tells us sin's going to get us all. And Eve, when she ate from that fruit, she died on that day. And when Adam ate from that fruit, he died on that day. It took time for it to catch up, but they died. And in that moment, something else happened. Death brought a realization that God never meant for us to have. This is fascinating. You know, we were made body, soul, spirit. But if you can imagine, there was a time, there was a time, only Adam and Eve ever experienced this, when, when, when humanity was not dictated by their body. We can't even imagine what that must have been like. Our nightmares include going to school or going to work and not having the right outfit on or no outfit on. Or we, we have nightmares of, you know, or what are we trying to do? We're trying to look a certain way and, and act a certain way and dress a certain way. Can you imagine a time when it didn't even, they didn't even recognize. In fact, the Bible says that they were naked and they didn't even know it. It, it just wasn't, an, they were driven by the, their spirit. But the Bible tells us that since that time, we've all been born into sin, which has brought a realization of the flesh. I'm aware of myself. And we're going to talk about that in just a few minutes. I've become aware of something God never wanted me to be aware of. God never wanted for you and I to be so self-consumed that we would only be able to see ourselves. God didn't make you for that. God made you a spiritual being able to connect to him perfectly. Adam and Eve wa walked with God in the garden. They were completely unaware that they had these bodies. They were just in the spiritual realm with God. But when they sinned, everything turned upside down. And they became completely consumed and aware. Look at verse 7, Genesis 3. The eyes of both were opened and they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together. And they made themselves loincloths. Self became the primary driving force of all humanity. And this defines every war that's ever been fought. This defines every selfish motive, everything that we've ever, it all comes down to this. I want what you have, or I want what everybody else has. has. I want it for me. I deserve it. Me, my, my rights, my freedoms, my enjoyments, my blessings. It's all about self. In fact, I want you to see there's five. We'll start with four, but there's five things that happened when Adam and Eve sinned. Self came into focus in five ways. Number one, they became, as we said, self-aware. Number two, they became self-conscious. Number three, they hoped to be self-sufficient. And number four, they were self-righteous. And we're going to talk about all this. It says that they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. You guys know that fig leaves are itchy leaves? It's the wrong leaf to use if you needed to sew clothing together. But imagine that. This is the ultimate expression of self-sufficient and self-righteous. I'm aware of myself, but I can take care of myself. You know, I'm sure Adam was impressing his wife. I can do this. Give me a few leaves, <laughs> you, know, you know, wear this. And then she's like, oh, where did you go shopping, Adam? You know, <laughs> and they're now itchy and scratchy and uncomfortable. And that is such an incredible picture of what it looks like when you try to be self-sufficient. I can take care of it. I can fix it. I can do it. Me, me, me. And I'm even saying that if you're a Christian, and I think most of us are. If you're a Christian, we are sometimes the most guilty of saying, I, okay, I know it's wrong and I won't do it anymore. Good luck with that. It's hard to change without God's help. Let me rephrase that. It's impossible to change without God's help. You can't, we can't even fix ourselves. Now, if you're trying to do something on your own, I can tell you what you can do. You can make a mess. We can mess things up. We're, it's amazing how good we are. Fixing things, that's harder for us. 
We need God's help. And imagine the very first time that man had ever sinned, their initial reaction. I mean, just their first thought was, I got to fix it. God made this whole universe. He put them in a perfect garden. He gave them everything they could ever want or dream of. And their first inclination is not, God, we need help. Their first inclination is, I can fix it. And friends, that, that, when you get into the I can fix it mode, you'll know something's wrong. I, I can make this better. Have you ever noticed a hole in your life and you decided to try to fix it? What, what, what do we do? We say, okay, I got to fill the hole in. So we dig a hole and, we, and then you look over and you're like, oops, I had to dig a hole to fill a hole. So you do it again. And eventually your life will be covered in landmines of trying to fix things on your own. When, listen, that might sound like bad news. It's not. You don't have to fix it on your own. That's the whole point of why Jesus became one of us. He came to die so that he can fix it for us. But unfortunately, sin makes us so self-aware and self-conscious, but it also puts in us a false idea of self-sufficiency and self-righteousness. Look at verse 8 of Genesis 3. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God. But the Lord God called to man and said, where are you? He said, I heard the sound of your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from the tree which I commanded you not to eat from? And the man said, the woman that you gave me, she gave the fruit of the tree and I ate. <laughs> Nobody teaches marriage conferences on Adam from Adam and Eve, you know. It's like starting point, you know, yeah. I want you to notice there, did you notice it in the, in, it says that God came down and did you notice it says the Lord God called to man? Did you notice it? Have you noticed that all the verses we've read since Adam and Eve had sinned, it reverted back to God. They called him God. The devil called him God. But when God came down, he says, the Lord God has come down. Did you see that? Even though they had sinned, I mean, literally, when you, when you, if you feel like you messed up your life, these guys messed up all of our lives. <laughs> Talk about feeling guilty. Okay. But the Lord God came down because even though they had sinned, he wasn't done. He loved them. He had a special relationship with them. He was not finished. And he comes down and he, and, and he does this game, you know, it's like hide and seek first game, hide, you know, first time man played hide and seek with God. Where are you? And they're hiding. Have you ever seen when the little ones, you know, if you remember when you had little ones and you played hide and seek and they'd hide right in the middle of the room? You know, they just like cover their heads and they get down. Because the view is this. If I can't see you, you can't see me, right? So if I do this, you're not there, right? And then you, and what do you do? You walk around, oh, where are you? Where are you? I can't see, you know. Can you imagine, you know, trying to hide from God? <laughs> And of course, it says that they hid in the bushes, but the problem is, is they're all itchy. So they're scratching. You know, bushes are moving because they're scratchy and they're itchy. Where, where, Adam, where are you? Let me ask you a question. Do you think God knew where Adam was? Right? He had GPS before we did. <laughs> Why ask the question? Because it was one more opportunity for Adam to do the right thing. God, hey, Adam, where are you? And Adam had a chance to step out from the bushes and say, I'm right here and we have a problem. I'm noticing something I never noticed before. I'm a human being. <laughs> I'm like you, but I'm not like you. I'm flesh. They realized that they were naked. And that's the fifth of the self. It's self-preservation. I will do whatever I have to do to take care of myself. And friends, you weren't made to take care of yourself. You were made to let God take care of you and to love you. Verse 13, the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So everybody's blaming everybody, you know. Adam's blaming his wife, his wife, you know, the devil made me do it, it was Eve's thing. The Lord God, notice he's not going to stop saying it. It's the Lord God from here on out. 
Man has sinned, but he's still the Lord God. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you will go and dust you will eat all the days of your life. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He will bruise your head and you will bruise his feet. So the devil is, um, you know, in essence, we read about the fact that he's going to be defeated He's going to bruise the heel of the Messiah, which is what happened at the cross. The devil hurt Jesus. But it also says that he would be defeated forever. And that's exact. It's interesting because where the devil hurt Jesus, Jesus defeated the devil. That cross, it hurt Jesus. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Total anguish, total pain, pain that we don't even, we could never understand. But at that same moment, his bruising was the devil's defeat. Right now, the devil's very real, very powerful, and very much wanting to ruin you. But listen, the Lord's in you and the Lord's with you. And we've said this verse, so we said it on Sunday too. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Who's in the world? The devil's in the world. But guess what? The Lord God is on your side. Have you sinned? Most certainly. Trying to preserve yourself? Probably. Thinking we're self-sufficient or self-righteous? Definitely. But the Lord God still comes to each one of us and is ready. He's ready. Let's start over. Let's do this again. We read, when we go on here in Genesis chapter 3, look at verse 16 just quickly. And we'll get other times to talk more in depth about it. He says to the woman, I will multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you will bring forth children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Look at what he says to the man, verse 17, and to Adam, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten the tree which I commanded, you will not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you will eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it'll bring forth for you. You will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken for you are dust and to dust you will return. Adam is always held more accountable than Eve, not because Eve was a woman. Don't misunderstand that. A lot of people will say that. It's not why. But Adam was given the role. You see, God always made man and woman equal with different roles. And that's always a hard thing for us to figure out because we equate in our world today, we equate role with the issue of equality. But it's not about equality. You know, where did God make woman from Adam, from the very center of Adam? He's, she was equal in every way, but they had different roles. And Adam's role was to lead Eve to help. And, and he abandoned his job. When Eve is sitting there talking to the devil, Adam's sitting over there like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Hmm. Wow. This is good. Want some? I don't know. Yes. I don't know. I'll take it. And then in his moment of what should have been triumph, God says, what happened, Adam? Adam cowers and says, if you wouldn't have made her, we'd be good right now. See, he's not blaming wife. He's blaming God. It was the woman that you gave me. If you'd given me a better woman, I would have been a better man. That's in essence what he's saying here. Ouch, right? And God slapped him. And no, no, no. I don't know that that's true. But do you understand? They were equal with different roles. Equal with different roles. Equal but different roles. Verse 20, the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Verse 21, and the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. I mean, we're talking cotton here and wool. We're talking good stuff now. Appropriate covering. And by the way, where did God get these skins? Something had to die. It's always the way it goes. For man to proper be, be, properly be clothed in God's righteousness, something had to die. Always how it's been. Verse 22, And the Lord said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take the tree of life and eat and live forever, the Lord God sent him out of the garden, out of Eden, to work the ground. Verse 24, He drove out man at the east of the garden of Eden. He placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Boy, it took us a long time to get to the flaming sword, didn't it? But you have to understand why it happened. So God kicks them out of the garden for a very clear reason. You see, God made two trees in there. God made one, I mean, among the many. One of them was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You eat from that, you're going to die. The other one was the tree of life. Eat from that, God bless you. You eat from that, you will live forever. Why did they not eat from that tree first? 
Why don't you start with the eternal life tree? But now they've sinned. They're going to die. Can you imagine had they eaten from the tree of life and never been able to die? God loved them too much. God loved them so much. He said, you know what? There's going to be an end. You know, I mean, uh, Joy and I went to, um, we went to a memorial last Saturday to, from a uh, family member who loved the Lord, knew the Lord, lived a nice, wonderful, long life, and then went to be with Jesus. Beautiful service and all. And, but every memorial reminds you, my end is near. My end is near. Hopefully not today or tomorrow, but my end is near. And you can't help it when you go there and, you know, and here's a person who'd lived a full life and had grandkids and, I mean, just uh, so much, you know, happiness around her and she loved her family and loved the Lord and, and, but yet, and still, you can't help but say, gosh, one day I'll be gone. One day I'm going to die. And, and the, the reason God took them out of the garden was so that they couldn't eat from a tree that would cause them to live forever. God wants them to die now because in their death, there's an opportunity for new life. And so God pushes them out because he loved them. And then he puts these, we read cherubim, which means angels with flaming swords moving in every direction. Just, and the Bible describes several times angels with swords. My favorite one is in Numbers 22. I'm going to just kind of briefly read it just because it's awesome. Israel is left Egypt and they're on their way through the land um, on, on the other side of the Jordan. And the nations around there, the tribes around, don't like Israel. They want them out of their land. And so they hire a prophet to curse Israel. And God speaks to this prophet and says, don't do it. But this guy loved money more than he loved um, God. <laughs> so he's like, I'm going to do it, God, but I promise I'll only say what you want me to say. So he's on his way to where they wanted him to go. And he's riding this donkey. Verse 22, God's anger was aroused, but he went and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as an adversary against him. He was riding his donkey and his two servants were with him. And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand. The donkey turned aside out of the way and went into the field. Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back onto the road. And the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on either side. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. He struck her again. The angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was nowhere to turn. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she laid down under Balaam. Balaam's anger aroused and he struck the donkey with his staff. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey and she said to Balaam, I always hear Shrek right now. I hear Shrek and donkey. It's, thank you very much. Yeah. The donkey speaks. What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? And once again, what is wrong with people? When an animal talks, Balaam said to the donkey, because you have abused me, I, was, I wish there was a sword in my hand because I'd kill you. The donkey said to Balaam, am I not your donkey? on which you have ridden ever since I became yours to this day. This is so bizarre, guys. Was I ever disposed to do this to you? And Balaam said, no. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand. And he bowed his head and he fell flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord said to him, why did you strike this donkey three times? Behold, I have come to stand against you because your way is perverse. The donkey saw me and turned aside, but you did not. This angel comes with sword drawn and what man didn't see, na human nature or nature did. Later on during King David's reign, and we'll, we'll wrap up here, almost done here. When King David was king, he had committed a terrible sin against the Lord. And the Lord come to him and said, I want you to pick three options. I'm going to do some damage in Israel, but I'm going to give you the choice. You can have famine, you can have this, you know, another country can come in and, and attack you, or I can strike you down for three days. And David said, I'd rather be in your hands, God, than in anybody else's hands. And God sent an angel of the Lord and the angel wiped out thousands and thousands of people. And David cries out to God, God, please stop. And the, and the Lord stopped. And then not that much longer, Hezekiah is the king of Israel and the Assyrians are coming against them and they've surrounded the whole country and they've surrounded the city of Jerusalem. 
And God sends an angel of the Lord, one angel we're told this time, and he, he killed 185,000 Assyrians in one swoop. One final story where we read about the flaming sword of God, the flaming sword of the angels. When Jesus was taken in the garden of Gethsemane, Peter pulls out his sword and he hits and he strikes the servant of the high priest's ear and he cuts it off. And Jesus quickly comes over and he puts the ear back onto the servant. And so there's no crime. Peter is released, but Peter, Jesus turns to Peter and he says, Peter, if my kingdom was from this world, I would call down right now 12 legions of angels. That's 72,000 angels, by the way, if you're wondering. And the idea, the way Jesus says it, he's not just saying I could do this. What he's saying is this, right now, there's 72,000 angels waiting for me to say kill. There's 72,000 angels in the garden of, you know, pitch black with only torches, but if there was donkeys, they probably saw too. But only Jesus there to see what was really happening there. What was happening is that the sky was lit up. The sky was full. 72,000 angels everywhere with swords drawn. Every one of them could wipe out 200,000 people without even batting an eye. And they're just waiting. Jesus, you cannot go this way. Jesus, you cannot let these people take you. You give the word and we will kill everyone. We'll kill them all. You know, we think of angels and you think cute little babies with little, you know, arrows and, you know, creating love in the world. And then you read about this and you're like, oh my gosh, these guys are studly. You know, these are, these are, these are warriors. When the Bible describes an angel, it refers to them as warriors. They're ready to speak God's word, but they're ready to do God's bidding at the same time. And yet at that time, did Jesus call down 72,000 angels? No. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. It's not what I, and, and, and so when we finish, as we finish tonight, I want you to consider this. And it's fun as the sun goes, as the sun's going down, you get to see fire more. God put before man, I don't want them to have the option of going back into and eating from a tree that could literally keep them alive forever. I don't want you to live forever in a fallen state. I want you to have a relationship with me. And that's not going to happen until I let my son die for you. So you're going to have to die. My son's going to have to die for you so that you could be born again. And when God, the very first time we read, when we talk about around the fire, when we talk about the fire of God, the first usage, the first time we see an angel, he's put there to keep you from access to something that will literally destroy you for the rest of your life. And I wonder when we get to heaven, if we won't get the DVD of our own lives, how many times there were angels moving us in the right direction or saving us. You know, I've heard some of your stories and it's no one, I mean, there was angels all over your lives protecting you. And I wonder if, if we don't get the opportunity to see how good God was to each one of us. And right now, maybe you're wrestling with this. Oh, I'm minimizing the blessings of God and I'm maximizing the problems of God. Listen, when you get to heaven one day, if you've put your faith in Jesus, you'll have opportunity to see it the way it really was. You'll get to see things the way they really were. Not the way you imagine them here on earth, but the way it really was. And I, I, I am, I'm so thrilled at the idea that God loved Adam and Eve enough to keep them from the very place he made for them. He made that place for them. But he loved them so much more. He wasn't her, oh, I made this for you. Come on. No, guys, you've got to get out of here because I want a relationship with you. I want to be, and so I'd rather you be aware of your mortality. I'd rather you, I'd rather you suffer. I'd rather you hurt than to let you eat from, of something, partake of something that will literally ruin you for the rest of your life. The flaming sword of God is where the story begins when we talk about around the fire. It's not where it ends, but it's where it begins. At a place where God says, you have to, and you know, you come near this fire afterwards, you all know because you're smart enough, you know, I, you know, I can get so close, but not too close. And that's what they learned on that day. I can get so close to the garden, but I can't get close as I can't go in anymore. I don't have access anymore because of my sin. And so I finish by reminding you, thank God for Jesus who quenched the fire of God's wrath so that we can have a relationship with God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the just incredible, boy, beautiful night and beautiful opportunity to worship you and to just to get into your word and to consider this idea, Lord, that you 
so loved us that you were even, you're even willing to let us be uncomfortable in this life. You're, you allow us to be aware of our own mortality so that we would recognize our need for you. Lord, I can see how hard it is for so many people in this world. It's hard for them to come to you. Their life is good. Their life is safe and secure. They feel at least that it is. And yet, Lord, every single one of us that's here, everybody that will watch this online, we're all aware of the reality that life is very, very precious and it, it can come and it can go so easily. And I pray, God, that you would encourage us, motivate us to a deeper walk with you because you love us so much that you pushed us out of a, a place that would have destroyed us. And Lord, we recognize that we've sinned and we don't want to buy into the lies of the devil that wants to minimize who you are in our life. No, instead, God, I pray that, you, that, that we would hear you speaking right now to us and saying, I am the Lord God. I love you and I have a plan for your life. Don't be distracted or moved or discouraged or defeated. I'm with you and I will never leave you. And I pray, God, that we would have confidence tonight, that we would have confidence that you're for us. We don't want to believe the devil's lies that you're against us. Help us to believe the truth tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name, bless your people. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for watching us today here at Calvary San Diego. We're so glad you took the time to be with us in our service. We'd like to encourage you that if you would like to see more of our studies, you can do so at our website. And we also want to give you the opportunity there to give if it would be in your heart to do so. You can do that at our website, calvarysd.com giving. We'd love for you to partner with what God's doing here in San Diego. God bless you guys.